Welcome back to Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bolbock and I'm coming at you from the Mosaic Work Studios. And today what I have for you is a conversation, a discussion about the different types of architecture diagrams that we could use. This seems to be a very debated topic in software development and I think for good cause because we went from th trying to do a uh, a standard that would work for any type of product to the reality of having very different products in very different contexts and trying to adapt to those contexts. And in doing so, we've also lost some of the practices that we were doing before. People understood that Agile means very low documentation and no architecture and stuff like that because everything will emerge when in reality this doesn't happen and we still need some architecture and we still need some uh, diagrams. So let's look a little bit at, uh, and let's start with uh, an article uh, called Solution Architect Tips, the five types of architecture diagrams published by Alan Helton. He is publishing a series called Better Programming in on medium.com. I read a few of his articles, they are quite interesting, so by all means check this out. And in this article he starts from a very typical context where I was having a conversation with a relatively new solutions architect who was trying to describe a system they had come up with. It had about eight different components to it and they all interacted with each other in multiple ways. They were explaining the solution using hand gestures and a lot of, and this piece communicates with this one by. I understood the words coming out of their mouth, but they didn't make sense strung together. Words get lost when explaining complex conceptual architecture. I was trying to build a mental model while following a train of thought. I needed a visual. I needed a diagram. And this is a very good point. Visuals are extremely powerful things. Uh, it's much easier to transmit nuance and knowledge through visuals and then have a conversation on something visual and add to it when you don't understand. And so uh, this is the beginning of the discussion of about diagrams. He also mentions uh, probably another article that he wrote, we discussed recently, that's a significant part of being a solutions architect is effectively communicating your ideas to both technical and non-technical audiences. And I think this is key. Now, I don't fully agree and I've never understood the separation between software architect, component architect, solutions architect. There are a bunch of different titles that to me don't make sense. What's important is in any kind of job that involves architecture is the ability to solve problems and communicate them. Solve problems collaboratively because you need to work with the team, you need to work with the technical people, but also with the product, with the business and so on and you need to be able to present your solutions, the solutions that you came up with to different types of audiences, and those audiences include uh, programmers, testers, uh, infrastructure, and operations, security, product, marketing, uh, business, sales, um, managers, sometimes domain experts, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, communications that need to be done, and this is best done through different types of diagrams. And that's very interesting because he's talking about five different types of diagrams that you should make depending on five different audiences. This is a different kind of approach than, for example, C4, which we'll touch briefly uh, in a moment, um, that gives you kind of a zoom out and then zoom in and then zoom in view of uh, architecture. 
this actually focuses on the audience and I think it's an interesting approach so let's take a look at it. First one, the flow diagram, the most generic and generally broadest reaching diagram you can make is the flow diagram. It is a medium to high level diagram that shows all the pieces of a workflow. This diagram illustrates the moving parts in a business process. And you have here a picture that I guess shows uh, an actor going to an HTTP page uh, that calls uh, AWS Lambda, that calls, uh, I guess, a database through events, uh, and so on. But it's all through, so it shows a flow, but it shows it through icons. The audience for this type of diagram is generally technical. It may be used to pitch an idea to an architecture board or describe how a business process works to a developer. The major component of the architecture flow diagram is the inclusion of all the moving parts. In the case of our serverless AWS environment, we label each managed service and which ones communicate with each other. No details on how the pieces interact with each other are described, but the diagram does show the connections. It shows how data flows through the system. I find this very interesting uh, because I like flow diagrams. I would actually like to see more flows and kind of the flow diagrams that are executable um, even as prototypes that would be great and I know there are some tools that are doing that but having this additional step it would mean that you can actually play with it interact with it and incrementally improve it and if you can also take that flow and actually implement on top of it, then might be a solution to many problems that I see. Uh, it's more complicated than it sounds, of course, but um, something might, I think there's quite an opportunity here to, to improve the way we do architecture. But let's go back. I like flow diagrams but not only for technical audiences i like them for uh, but it, i guess it's a different type of flow diagram it's the user flow through the system which i feel is missing here maybe there will be something uh, i know he has a persona diagram maybe something will be there but then might be very useful for um presenting solutions to a non-technical audience. But let's go and see the next diagrams first. Uh, the service diagram, a service diagram illustrates connectivity from a high level. It does not show any details on how the workflow or service works, but instead shows the major pieces at play. This is a diagram intended to show the internal versus external services used in an application. So this kind of shows that we are using something from our cloud and that calls a third party environment. Audience, this is for IT and network engineers. I would also say security. <clears throat> they care about any connections you are making to outside services, plus they need to know if any internal connectivity needs to be monitored. Yeah, so this is something that's very useful for a few reasons. Um, uh, monitoring, it's useful for resilience. Uh, it's useful for security because people, security people will look at these connections and figure out if there were brainstorm any potential vulnerabilities. Uh, so yeah. I often use this diagram to describe how systems work to executives. They want to know the connections between major applications and there is nothing better than the service diagram to represent those connections. Interesting, uh, this sounds a lot like one of the C4 diagrams, uh, the system context diagram. Uh, it's a different approach though. Uh, so this is much more detailed the other one is more high level, I guess. 
When building an architecture service diagram, it's good to list all the microservices that make up your application or ecosystem. All right, if you are using microservices, label which services communicate with each other and be sure to make the distinction between services your company owns and services that are external. Details on how the services work are not necessary for this high level diagram. This is all about the services that make an application run. Oh, so this is basically the system context diagram. Okay. Three, the persona diagram. It is important to show that your architecture solves a business problem. A persona diagram describes a chronological view and actors of a particular workflow. This is your best tool for proving that you've taken the business into consideration when developing your solution. I find it funny that, so this shows on the first, first of all, it has three levels, user system, third party. First level, user interacts with the system. So it's kind of what we've seen in the first diagram. Second part is the system. Third part is the external service. This is like, what would you call this? A combination between use case and interaction diagram, more or less. Um, and this is the kind of diagram that I feel is missing from C4, uh, like a more dynamic diagram. I know Simon Brown has been working to add some of these dynamic diagrams uh, there, but the, the dynamic view on the system, like what is going on in what order, who needs to call who, and so on. Um, this is very different from the static view that just shows how pieces are in your system. Business-oriented individuals and product owners are the intended audience for, for this type of diagram. They are focused on personas and how they interact with the system, showing them a graph of who does what and when will perfectly describe what your system is doing. Mm, more or less, I mean, they would like to see the user interface as well. So I feel that things are missing here, but okay. The architecture persona diagram dips into the BPN model a little bit, All right? This is another model that's quite um, useful, uh, business process modeling. Um, and this business process modeling actually uses a lot of workflow stuff. So make use of swim lanes to show different actors in a workflow. This time the diagram tends to be lower level as it includes more detail than the others. Be sure to label the person at the workflow and any assumptions on how the business process gets from one step to the other. These diagrams also help developers who are new to a domain that offer insightful context into what they will be building. Okay. I mean, I can see that it gives you a lot of in important information. Um, there are also alternative ways of doing that. This is probably not be my favorite one, but this is why we are here to, to look at different ways of <laughs> solving these problems uh, with architecture diagrams. All right, the fourth diagram is the infrastructure diagram, is what you see is what you get model. It represents everything that has been implemented, a low level diagram in nature. It is meant to be inclusive of everything that exists in a service application ecosystem. The purpose is to show what has been built and how the system currently works. Consider this a blueprint of the application you built. And it shows that you have in this case, the example, it's an HTML service that has some REST calls like put, get, delete, post, and another post. Some of those go to a Lambda and to an S3 bucket, others goes to an event bus and to a Lambda and so on, to database, to file system. Okay. The audience for an infrastructure diagram varies. It can be used to show developers what they have to work with in a specific microservice. It could also be used to show a client or the resources your company uses to accomplish a task. Um, this 
might also be useful for estimating or for explaining infrastructure costs because you might explain on this S3 bucket we have that many data and that means you know that many dollars and these lambdas they have the that many calls it could also be used for looking at performance issues because you can identify bottlenecks um, okay you can point to them so i i find this overall this looks very quite fine um it's a good diagram particularly for rest style services that use labs, let's say serverless style architectures uh, where you have a lot of different components built with uh, vendor provided services like aws and or whatever you are using for serverless uh, when building an architecture infrastructure diagram don't leave out any pieces the goal of this type of diagram is to show everything in your app and how it all connects you don't need to go into too much detail on how it works, but rather focus on getting all the pieces of your app included in the diagram. These diagrams often require a large amount of work to maintain, but it is possible to automatically generate them in your CI pipeline. And then there's a link to another uh, article. We have talked about um, code how would you call those? So architectural diagrams built through code, uh, plant UML or structurizer. These are tools that you can use to generate your diagrams from code. And this makes this job, or it can make it easier by having the diagrams um, source controlled um, and very close to your source code. And uh, included in your CI pipeline. So I'm a fan of this, but some you have to take into account that the model for creating these diagrams is a little bit different. Uh, we are used with what you see is what you get editors, things where you can drag and drop blocks and connections and add labels and all kinds of stuff. In this case, it's more of a write, compile, write, compile, write, compile. And then from time to time, you need to work around some weird, how would you call them? Issue, not issues necessarily, but weird things that are implemented in these tools and they will not place the errors exactly as you'd like to and so on. So you need to let go of some of those, um, let's say, stylistic things. Um, so it's very possible to fight a bit with plant UML or with structurizer. On the other hand, they, they are, they provide this value that everything is source controlled and with your CI automatically generated and included in your CI pipeline, which makes things much easier. Um, also, if you are using any kind of diagram like this, don't forget to have in your definition of done that you need to update the diagram and actually update the diagram. <laughs> okay, it's very important because otherwise the diagram will lag behind and it doesn't help anymore. Okay, and then five, the developer diagram. When you need to get down to brass tags, the developer diagram is going to be your best bet. It includes everything a developer will need in order to build a solution. Okay, now I'm curious. The goal is to answer any questions that might come up by looking at the flow diagram and include them in the design. This is the lowest level design of the bunch that it is intended to get the idea across without your presence. Shaman should be able to read these diagrams and know exactly what to do. So you have a post call to a slash gophers and then it's described as valid schema at gateway. Then it goes into a lambda, transform data valid, then not a duplicate return to a one on success. Then it goes to 
think an event bus save data in the GOP for facet include user ID in GSI, whatever GSI is, uh, goes to message bus, share existing stream handler, validate record is new gopher, and then publish gopher related SNS topic at gopher type as filter. Oh, okay, so this is a, a message SNS topic. Yeah, that's kind of like a message queue of sorts. All right. Um, so this looks pretty good for serverless. Um, it gives a lot of information. What I think is missing here is the list of additional conventions that you are following, like how do you do authentication? What do you need to log? What are the security things? Uh, th those are missing from here, but I wouldn't expect them from be here. The point is that they need to be somewhere. And I'm curious if this article says anything about uh, these missing implementation details. Okay, the developers are the audience, the level of detail is unnecessary for people outside of your team, providing implementation details uh, to people outside of the development team is a perfect example of too much detail. Okay, so you don't, we only need it for inside the team. The architecture developer diagram is essentially the flow diagram with added detail Label each piece with any specific implementation detail you can think of and be sure to label important transitions. This type of diagram does not replace user stories, but it does help enhance them and to increase understanding across the development team. Use them uh, when you can, because when the implementation is done, you'll have a useful artifact to reference in the future. Well, okay. I have some thoughts, but we'll go back to, to those in a moment. All right, so there are many types. In conclusion, there are many types of architecture diagrams. Each one serves a unique purpose. Many serve different audiences. As a solutions architect, I would say as an architect, you must be able to provide the right type of diagram to the right people when pitching your ideas. Oftentimes, one version of the diagram isn't enough. When I start a new design, I always start with a flow diagram. I get all my thoughts down and pitch it to another software architect. So once we agree on a solution, I take the diagram, turn it into a persona, and take it to the business folks, then get the sign off, then make the developer diagram and the service diagram. Service diagram is given to executives to make sure they get a high level view of what they are doing. The developer diagram is given to the engineers who are going to be implementing the solution. Once the solution is built, we can update the infrastructure diagram to include the new work. A picture is worth a thousand words, but when it comes to architecture diagrams, that might be worth 5,000. Being able to get people to understand your idea quickly and easily is the key to being a great solutions architect. I always use draw.io to build my diagrams. It's a free tool that provides everything you need to make beautiful, comprehensive charts, models, and diagrams. Yeah, I've used a little bit draw.io. Um, I like it. I, I still prefer the, to generate my diagrams from code whenever possible, or to use something like Miro, which is more um, flexible with what I need. But you do you. So these are uh, ideas. So I find it interesting that, as, as you can see, this matches a specific process and a specific context. And my feeling is that the things that they are solving are not very user-centric, but they are more like technology centric. And the reason I'm saying this is because the, there's an alternative to these diagrams, which would be to use first a user story map, so first personas actually. So you identify the personas in your uh, system 
And by persona, I don't mean the actor, like it's here. So when I, when I see persona diagram, uh, I don't want to see a user here. What I want to see is something like Kathy the cashier or uh, Maddie the manager or something like that. Um, an actual defined, described persona in terms of the demographics and interaction with our product. So we start by de defining these personas and then we do what is called the user story map. So let's see if we can find user story map. An example of a user story map. Um, Or this is something that I just found I haven't searched beforehand, but that's kind of how a user story map would look like. And this is focused on the user, like what the user is, what the persona in that case is trying to accomplish. In this case, it would be organize email, manage email, manage calendar, manage contacts. So you have a bunch of things that they need to do. And then underneath each of those, you would have what do we call user stories? Um, and you group those user stories in, I like to group them into increments that are very small. And then from those increments build releases. So I like to go actually even smaller and have some, some steps of, for example, search email would not be the first thing that I would be doing here. Probably, well, search email Im implies that you already have some emails. So what I would do first is show the list of emails and then uh, create some folders or search or you prioritize them based on two important criteria, one being what's most useful for our user, the most value for our user the second is the time to develop roughly okay we don't uh, need to estimate necessarily but it's like if you look at these some of these will most likely be more difficult to do than others right so probably search by keyword is something that's very fast uh, so and once you have these, you have the personas, you can then go and detail for your persona, for your user story, what is your architecture? What is the solution that you are proposing? And if we go back to the diagrams here, you can add to and actually this is what i would do i would add and expand the diagram of um, the user flow through the application or the different user flows because in that in the example that we looked at we had three different or four different user flows like manage emails and so on so you would take for example manage emails and then detail, you could expand that and do this flow diagram. And this makes sense, as I said, particularly where you have serverless or even where you have a high number of components that you need to connect, like in large enterprise applications, you might need to say, we need to call this existing service and then the return value goes to we do something with it and then it goes to that, the other existing service and so on. Or we start that process in that area of the um, of our architecture that's already been done and working and so on. So you do this and I see a lot of sense in doing that. 
and if you want you can do this although from my point of view I would like another type of diagram and I'm gonna show you in a minute how how things are with C4 um, I kind of like this one um, the persona diagram but it's not I mean, you can do the same thing on a normal um, expanded story map by adding things, uh, by adding labels or some kind of color code that says this is the system. And we do this all the time. And then in the end, um, I kind of like the, the infrastructure diagram. And particularly for REST services and things like that, I think the this diagram for developers is, is very good. Um, so, so yeah, mixed feelings. I will do things slightly different, but this just shows that there are so many ways of solving this problem of architecture, of communicating architecture that it's important to find one that works for you and to to use it effectively right um, this is a very valid one for this type of context if you are working more closely with your product people if you are involved in things like experiments and understanding users and all these kinds of stuff then you might need additional things like the user story map an actual persona and so on now let's quickly look at c4 compare and contrast right just because this is another one of the common um, examples of let's say diagram systems there's also uml uh, but I won't go in details in that. So basically we have, this is the C4 model. It starts from, see if we can zoom in actually. No, I can't. Um, it starts from a system context diagram, presentation mode, okay. Uh, this is a system context diagram for, for an internet banking system. So what we have here is, first of all, we have a, a user. It's not a persona, really, in this case. Uh, it's very focused on the system. The user, uh, there's a lot of labeling here a lot of description and this is something that I was missing from the the other diagrams this is something that Simon Brown keeps saying that you need a lot of labels because okay drawings are nice but you also need to understand to get the right details so you'll have a personal banking customer who is a person a customer of the bank with personal bank accounts Views account has an action, views accounts balances and makes payments using the internet banking system. That is a software system, allows co customers to view information about their bank accounts and make payments. And this one communicates, and this is where the grayed out things are actually third parties or things that are already in your system get account information from and make payment using mainframe banking system. And if you've been working with a bank, they usually tend to have some old core banking uh, system. Uh, this is a very common pattern. And then you have an email system that will send emails so the internet banking system will send emails using this email system that will send emails to our customer. And now if we want to see more details, we can zoom in. 
And we actually zoom in to another type of diagram, which is a container diagram. Container, not as in Docker, but it shows you the components, more or less, that are deployed together. So you'd have, um, well, actually that's not correct. A container in C4 is any piece of software that you deploy. Right? Because it can be a Java package, it can be something that you deploy in a web uh, server or let's say Java runtime environment, a mobile app. So it can be an application, an executable, a library, um, a service, a database, uh, or any other kind of data store, and so on. And so, for example, what you have here is a web application that's deployed on a Java and Spring MVC. Um, and it delivers to the customer's web browser a single page application that is JavaScript and Angular. You also have a mobile app um, using Xamarin. Both make calls to an API that writes and reads from a database. And this is the second level of Zoom. And typically this is enough to start development in most cases. If you want, you can go to lower level in Zoom where you take one of those components and you blow it up. And in this case, we have the component internet banking system, the API. And the API is inside this container and is called by single page and mobile app. It writes to the database, it uses the email system, it uses the mainframe banking system. Um, all the API calls, as we can see, are described and they are made using JSON and HTTPS. And then you, you have a view into the internal workings of this because it's a um, uh, Spring MVC REST application, it will have a Spring MVC REST controller and beans and so on. But this already goes into technical details. And these are the different components. Now, it doesn't matter how you deploy these components, but they need to be well-defined and kind of separate. And then if you want to go even deeper, you can go and see the actual diagram, uh, for the class diagram, which is not that important. Well, he calls it the code diagram, I think. But that is not that important. Now, the thing I'm missing, uh, this is a very good system, and I've noticed that it's very easy to understand by people starting to do architecture because it fits the mindset of a developer trying to solve a problem. Like you you start from a high level and then you go into more details, more details, and more details. Trouble is when you're doing architecture, you have a few more things. You have architectural concerns, which are different depending on the application you are architecting. The typical ones would be performance, security, reliability, and scalability, uh, but uh, those can vary, okay? And you can have additional ones, like um, how easy it is to modify, how easy it is to add more things, um, how easy it is to collaborate to other people who might be want to add to your product and so on. So there are a lot of, of different types of architectural concerns, but let's assume you just focus on the main ones. Those should be defined somewhere and then you need to iterate between those levels 
and figure out what would be some potential issues in terms of scalability, performance, and so on. And those are much better served by other types of diagrams, like data flow diagrams. The data flow diagram will just show the large components and how data flows between them. Another thing that I'm missing here is the dynamic view. So I don't understand the process. What is the problem that we are trying to solve? Okay, there's a little bit here in the system context diagram, but it's not a lot. And what I'm missing is how, what problem are we solving? How are we solving it? What is the user interaction? And so on. Because these might be important things, even for technically oriented products. Like even if you have an API, okay, if it's only used by the people in your team, then maybe you don't have to do too much. But if it's meant to be used by third parties, by outside developers, then already you need to do some more things there. So all in all, this is a very good system and he's been working on adding some more stuff like the system landscape where you have a software system you show the relationship between one system and other systems in your organization a generally called dynamic diagram uh, which is based on the communication diagram similar to the UML sequence diagram you have a deployment diagram, which looks kind of so it's similar with what we would have here as infrastructure, I think. Well, more or less, it's, it's a different focus. Uh, the deployment diagram is incredibly useful for security, for performance, for reliability. So if you care about those things, uh, and if you need to discuss about them with different, with your experts in infrastructure and security and all that, uh, you have a, you definitely have a use for this. And, okay, so, so this is also extensible and you can use it through different tools like Structurizer, Plant UML, what is he mentioning here? I think Archie, something I always forget. Um, Archimate. Okay, so these are integrated with different tools. But the point here is, and I think we've done this um, right now, we made this point that, okay, I think we are in a point where we understand that the diagrams and your architectural process needs to fit your product and your context. The issue here is that you can just start from scratch and invent things. <laughs> you need to get inspired from what came before. And what came before we have UML, which is, I would say heavyweight, um, is very, there's, there are too many diagrams. Um, not all of them are interesting. And I think most people don't want to go there. Although there are some of the diagrams that make a lot of sense. Like, use case diagrams, sequence diagrams, they, they do make a lot of sense. Now, if you want to feel like you're using something more modern, you'll probably want to look into something like C4 or get inspired, particularly for serverless kind of work, maybe, or microservices or this kind of, any type of 
service-oriented architecture where you have a lot of different moving parts in a distributed system. Maybe something like what we've seen before, um, the, these five diagrams proposed by Alan Helton might be an inspiration. So I hope that I gave you enough ideas to think about how to use, uh, how to create a better way to communicate architecture for you in the conversations that you are having with your team, with your uh, infrastructure experts, with your domain experts, with your product people, marketing, sales, legal, even legal becomes a factor sometimes, uh, business management, C-level, you know, all these kinds of people who, particularly if you are working on an important product, they want to know things and you need to be able to explain them. And the best, fastest way to explain them is by showing a diagram. And I hope I we gave you some ideas on how to do that. So with this being said, um, what do you think about these diagrams? Would you use them? Would you try them? Have you tried the other types of diagrams that you'd like to share with everyone else? Let us know in the comments. We love comments. Um, we actually started doing videos prompted by comments because some of the comments were very, very interesting and uh, they gave us ideas for other videos. So maybe if you post an interesting comment, who knows, your comment might become a video. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Thank you kindly for the view and until next time, remember to think, design and work smart.